Are you searching for fulfillment? <laughs> Discover true happiness. Stay tuned to Shalom World. Welcome to this Lenten season. My name is Father Dan Gernick from Mount St. Francis Retreat Center in Cochrane, Alberta. You know, sometimes when you want to scare somebody, you often will holler, you know, maybe hide behind a door or hide somewhere under the staircase and you, you jump out and you scream at the person to scare them. But on the other spectrum of being afraid is silence and solitude. You know, some people, are afraid of being silent, of having times of solitude. At the retreat center here, we have silent retreats. And there, we hear many people that say, oh, no, 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 I could, I could never do that. And I recall one conversation with a friend who was telling me, I, I don't understand how anyone can do a, do a silent retreat. Now, the retreats here are typically on the weekend, and the silence is for 40 hours. So you have 40 hours of silence and solitude. Now, that kind of reflects Jesus, his 40 days of silence and solitude in the desert. Or we can think of the, the Israelite people who were 40 years in the wilderness or the desert. And so having that time of silence and solitude is actually rejuvenating for people. And so my friend who had never been on a silent retreat somehow, someway got herself involved in a nine-day silent retreat. And she was pleading with me day in and day out, please pray for me. I don't think I'm going to survive. Now, why would she say something like that? Well, likely because we're so used to maybe the TV being on. We're used to scrolling on the internet. We're used to listening to music. Or simply, if you're extroverted, you're, you're used to talking. But even extroverted people need to balance that out with silence and solitude. Now, I say silence and solitude because we, we ought to not exp or expect that this time is going to be where we're going to feel lonely. You know, some people might also say that, no, I don't want to do a silent retreat because I will feel lonely or I already feel lonely enough, so why would I want to do that? But I often hear that people will say that they feel connected with the other people who are on retreat and they don't feel lonely, they actually feel quite connected. And even though you don't ask somebody to pass you the salt, you actually feel like you're communicating with other people through gestures, a simple smile. Now, going back to my friend who was afraid of a silent retreat, she did survive. She did get through the silent retreat, and she, she was amazed on how beautiful and how rejuvenating it really was for her. And now she comes regularly on silent retreats. Now, I, even though right now I work at a retreat center, I have to say that I always haven't been one who has appreciated the silence and solitude. So before I entered my journey of formation to be a Franciscan friar and eventually a Franciscan priest, I first joined the seminary for, the, for a diocese. Now, during the time in the seminary, one weekend per month, we would have what's called a day of recollection. It was a 24-hour period where we were expected to be at the seminary, most likely in our room or in the chapel, and being quiet. 
Now, I didn't really understand the whole purpose of this, I have to admit, when I went through the first one. And we had to eat in silence, and you could hear the banging and clanging of the people with their forks and knives against their plate. And I thought, well, how is this supposed to be rejuvenating and a renewal type experience? And so the first day of recollection, I just went off and I did my own thing. And of course I did get caught. And so my director asked me, what was I doing? And I said, oh, I just went and did this and that. And he says, well, you should part he encouraged me to participate in the day of recollection recollection. And I said to him with great humility, I said, oh, I didn't realize I had to. Of course I did, but who knows? So the next time we had a day of recollection, I, I thought, okay, I, I got to be a little bit more secretive about this. And so I partway through, I, I, I couldn't do it anymore. I decided, okay, enough's enough. So I went and I visited a friend who worked at a coffee shop and just sat in there for a while. This particular time, I didn't get caught. And then the next time it rolled around, it was interesting. I had a little bit of a change of heart. There was a moment where I was like, wow, actually, now I, I kind of understand the purpose of this. You know, sometimes we will say to ourselves, oh, I, I need to go and say my prayers. And so we, we go off and we maybe repeat certain prayers. Maybe we even pray the rosary. We... Um, we pray for other people. A lot of it is vocalizing. But part of being in solitude and silence is to listen. And so it's to be able to listen to our the voice of God, but also to listen to our own desires. And I think when we're in tune with, with our own desires and with, with God, then we know best what, what to do in our lives. And so a lot of people... One, one, my favorite thing about a silent retreat is actually lunchtime when people are about to depart. Now, now that, that seems a little bit crazy and a little bit bizarre. Why would I be happy about that? Now, the reason is, is because I see the way that people are transformed through the whole process of the silence and solitude. You know, they are clearly rejuvenated. Even one woman, I still, you know, you, when you have certain memories that just come back to you, I recall her saying to me as she was leaving the, the, out the, the main entrance, she said, I feel like I found myself, you know, because sometimes what really happens is that our minds get going and we get so much, and then we just put more information in from the TV, from the internet, from, uh, from even other people in our conversations that we get caught up in who we truly are. And so this woman identified who she was. On another occasion in the, uh, the women's prison, I recall meeting this one woman and she was in segregation. Now, oftentimes segregation, and I never really truly understood it, is, was because somebody had done something wrong and they needed to be separated from the other people for the safety of the other people and also possibly themselves. And so it was a way to, to kind of more of a deterrent to help people to not do anything wrong inside the institution. And sometimes the person would get called to what's called the duty office. And the, as soon as the person walked into the room, there would be a camera, one of the correctional officers with a camera, and they would be led down to the segregation unit. So really, this would be a time of solitude and silence. Now, the challenge, though, is sometimes as human beings, and I recognize this, is that if you're dealing with something on the inside or an incident has just happened where you've had a dispute with somebody, is you need to talk that out. And so sometimes it actually is kind of contrary to what the person's person needs. But this one particular woman, she decided that I want silence and solitude for this moment in my journey in the prison. Now, the reason for this actually is because she was going to be released soon and she didn't want to have to deal with any of the 
I'll, I'll use the word drama that was happening inside the prison because you can easily get caught up in that and you can end up in fights that you don't want to be in or you can end up saying things that you regret. So she felt that the best way to prepare herself to go back into the world was to spend this time of silence and solitude. Now, if we look at Jesus Christ, I mean, Jesus really was preparing himself to go into the world as well in his time in the wilderness. It's interesting that Jesus has spent his life as a carpenter's son, and then he's he's been baptized, and it's, it's like he's ready to go into action. And what does he do? He retreats, and he spends this time of quiet and solitude in, in the wilderness. And Jesus did this many times. You can find this many times in the scriptures where Jesus withdraws to a quiet place. It's, it's like if the, if the Son of God needs to do this, then so do we. I remember one older friar in his 90s, so you, you know that this is going to be wisdom. He always said, if the Son of God had to take time for quiet and solitude to pray, then certainly we do as well. And so this, this woman would spend the last three months of her time in the prison in silence and solitude. But I would go and visit with her every week. And I have to admit that because she had the intention of, do, of having that time of silence and solitude as preparation, that she kept a good attitude. Only once did she kind of get a little bit wound up when... Uh, a certain person came on to the unit, but uh, she was actually quite delightful to be in. And so I had the opportunity to meet this woman on the outside, that is to say, once she was released from prison, and I could see that that time of silence and solitude had been good preparation for her to go out into the community. And she was quite happy and she was quite delighted to have a photo with the two of us together. And now I'd like to explain another situation of a person who was in silence and solitude. And so this was at a maximum security prison. Now, if we think of a maximum security prison, often these people don't get a lot of movement. They are alone by themselves. And, you know, sometimes this can, can work against us. You know, sometimes when we're feeling lonely, and we all get that inside of us, we feel like, you know, something's not right or I need to reach out to somebody else. And, you know, in different moments in our lives, we may feel like, oh, it'd be nice for more people to visit us. So these people who are in a maximum security prison are really confined. And, and even if you're not in segregation, you are often isolated, you know, to the point of being you know, silent and also in solitude. Now, there, there are ways to, to teach people to, to, how to deal with this, how to pray. And what's interesting is that even secular society now is saying that meditating every day, which means sitting in silence, is healthy for us. It, it can be rejuvenating. And I think part of what helps in that situation is that we take time to allow our inner being to slow down. You know, if we just keep adding more and more stuff, then we, we, we get too bogged down. And so just taking moments to meditate, to even just look out and see the beautiful mountains or look at a tree or listen to a bird or read something and then put it down and just ponder that, it can be very healthy for us. And so uh, when I'm going to this maximum security prison, I am going there to to preside at mass. But one of the individuals in the segregation unit asked if I would come and celebrate the sacrament of reconciliation with him. Now, I have to say that, you know, there was, there was a little bit of fear, you know, okay, I'm going to go see this particular guy, and uh, it's not exactly a very cozy and rosy place, and I was a little bit of afra afraid of this situation. And so, you know, after Mass, then the chaplain said, okay, now we'll go visit the gentleman down in the segregation unit. And so as we walked down, we had to go through these very large metal doors that slam shut. And so we eventually ended up in this room where there was officers that were watching us behind glass. And there we were in this room that had a, it's kind of almost like a, a Tim Hortons restaurant where it has the the table that's welded to the ground. 
And they gave me this, what's called a PPA, or it's a personal panic alarm. If anything goes a little bit crazy, you just press the button and Superman will come to your rescue or, or people will come to your rescue. So I'm sitting there and my heart is racing. And uh, I, the gentleman comes out and we introduce ourselves. And as the conversation is going on, I see that, okay, this is not so bad. I mean, I, I, I ought to not be afraid. But I, I had to sort of question him, you know, why are you here? And not that I, not that I really said that out loud, but that's inside of my own heart. And something had happened, he had done something wrong, and that's why he had ended up in, in the segregation unit. And so you can think of this very confined place that this gentleman is in, and he's in this time of silence and solitude, but this is a different time. And this is really a time when he needed to fear not, you know, that God was with him in, in probably the darkest and the loneliest time of this guy's life, when something has gone wrong and he wants to confess that obviously and obviously other things that had been spinning around in his mind and in his heart for many years he wanted to share that with another human being and so he shares what he needed to share and i won't get into that but one of the things that he said to me is that i'm afraid that somebody's going to come and get me now i'm thinking to myself and of course, you know, I don't always say things that come to my thoughts that you are in the most confined place in likely all of Canada. Nobody is going to get you. In one sense, you're rather safe. But it's it, what happens, though, if we if we don't prepare ourselves, or if we don't have the right attitude we, when we enter into our silence and solitude, is that not only fear but all these negative thoughts can build up within us to the point that we think that somebody is going to come and get us. Now, this gentleman, at least in my experience, wasn't dealing with any sort of mental illness that would create this. This was just a matter of negative thoughts that were spinning around to the point that made him believe that he was going to get, uh, or he was in trouble in a very confined place. But the thing is, is that really what needed to happen for him to be able to, to calm down within his, his heart, to be able to deal with his particular situation is just simply to share that out loud. And so sometimes what can be often beneficial is for people to go on what's called a directed retreat. Now, a directed retreat is much the same. You spend a lot of time in silence and solitude, but you get to meet with a spiritual guide or director for one hour each day and so that can allow you to unload what you need to unload and also prepare you for the next 23 hours of your day now what's very interesting is that this process is often the is very heavy at first but because people are leaving their very busy lives their very active lives of all kinds of noise entering their 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 mind and their heart, and then they are slowly calming down through this time of silence and solitude. And so obviously the first time that they get together with me, they need to, they need to unload this information so that they can experience this, this very rejuvenating and this very renewing um, part of being a human being. And so I invite you, if you've never done any type of retreat, you know, maybe, you know, as kind of like university students, they often will come on a retreat, but they'll have moments of silent during their time, but they won't have the whole thing silent. Maybe that could be the first step. Maybe the next step is to go for a 40 hour retreat of silence. And then, you know, I did meet somebody who signed up for a six-day retreat, which was silent as well. Now, I don't recommend that for your first time, or I can think of my friend who went on the nine-day retreat. You know, we have to pick and choose what's going to be beneficial for us. But one of the very simple things that I often do is I spend a little bit of time, 10 to 15 minutes, twice a day in, in just silence. And you know, so I, when I say silence, it's not to say that my mind shuts off and, and nothing goes, goes on within my own being, 
but I, I'm not gonna talk to anybody. I'm not gonna scroll through the internet. I'm not gonna see what, what's going on in the news. I am just going to be silent and to, to be aware, to make, to, to be aware that God is with me. And, and, and is that not one of the most rejuvenating things in life is just, you know, we're going really busy and then we just take the time to be silent so that we can be aware that God is with us. And, and it's really the awareness of God that can take away any fear, any bad fear that we may be holding on to or that may be stopping us from doing what we need to do in life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So good and loving God, we thank you for the many times that we have to be silent and to be with you. We ask for you to bless us for the, during the times when we may be afraid to be silent, to be with you, and just assure us of your presence. And may we continue to take the time to do what's healthy for ourselves and for our relationship with you. And may Almighty God bless and keep you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And let us go in peace and joy, proclaiming the good news of God. encouraged by what I've seen of Shalom Media and the uh, sorts of events that they promote uh, across Canada. We hear our Holy Father speaking often about a new evangelization for today's world. That is going to call for media, modern media, to be involved in spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. So we ask the Lord to bless Shalom Media and all of your efforts to bring the good news into homes, into people's lives. Amen.